Hi, Aaron. Welcome to the Good Mood Podcast. <laughs> Thank Glad you to be for here. Joining me. And we were trying to get this interview going for a while. And so I'm so excited that, uh, yeah, that you are joining. And how I met you is at an addictions workshop. I think it was Project Starlight. Mm, yeah, it was. You were, yeah, you remember that? Yeah. Um, and yeah, you were running it. It was great. I remember it was a, a couple days, probably a weekend, right? A few years ago. Do you remember what year that was? I think it was, I want to say 2015. I was pretty new. I was a newbie. I was brand new grad. And I remember, um, yeah, it was great. Like it, really good info. And I think there was um, one piece that I really took home was because I had, I had learned a little bit about um, like supporting. So we'll get into everything. So I'm just going to tangent, but I was, I was, I learned a little bit about supporting family and friends who are dealing with addictions through Al-Anon, a 12 step program for family members of alcoholics or, or addicts, I guess. And um, there was, there's this huge piece around um, and I can't even remember what it's called, but it's like loving detachment or something like that. It's sort of like leaving the person to to kind of fend for themselves. And I really remember you had a different take on it that was really eye-opening and helpful. And I don't know why that stuck in my mind, but it just was something that I was like, um, I guess I was feeling a lot of like certainty and conviction around my previous beliefs that this workshop kind of helped me feel like, you know. Pushed you a little bit. To, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, you don't know everything, Talia. So. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it, yeah, exactly. and as you, as you talk about that, it, like the piece that um, I always bring into any work that I'm doing, and whether it's educational workshop, if I've taught in, in, in a class or if I'm working with patients is that, um, you know, Alan on obviously friends and family of people that are going through alcohol or, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, other drugs, substances, um, it's that's the um, that's coming from a family member, a support person, right? And um, and uh, you know, I've got my own addiction story, mm -hmm. so I I get to bring in the piece of of someone who has struggled with addiction and has been on the other side. And of course, I mean, my experience is not everyone else's experience, and and just because I felt this way and, and this worked for me and. And this is how my family supported me. And this is how they pushed me away. doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that my way is the right way. It just offers a different perspective, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes that's, it's, it's important for family members, loved ones to see that, oh, you know what, maybe I, I didn't look at it this way. Yeah. I think it's, so it's love for anything. Like, I don't know about you, but a lot of family members of people with mental health issues reach out to me for help for their family member. And I don't really, it's hard because I've had lots of like parents, partners of people who are suffering sort of bring their loved one in and the person just can't receive, it's hard. It's just not, a, it's usually just an intake and then I never see them again. And I try and communicate that with the family members, but sometimes that could be the thing. I don't know, you know, so you never- Could be know. the seed. Could be the seed that's planted. Totally. Yeah, I'll, I'll often tell, I mean, the same thing with, I mean, I work with mental health as well, but I would say my passion really is, is working with individuals and family members of individuals struggling with addiction. And you, you, you actually bring up a really important piece. And, and that is that I can't want this more than the person that's struggling, right? And often I will see the family members want this more than their loved one. And so if a, if a mother, father, brother, friend reaches out, it's really important that, that I mean, I can, I'll chat with them. I have no problem about that. I can give resources. Um, but I won't book an appointment for their loved one. I mean, first off, that's, you know, morally, I, I don't think it's right that the individual needs to want to do this and want to know that we're doing this. Um, mm -hmm. But I also want to see a little bit of movement towards me from the other individual. You know, I'm, I'll meet you halfway. I'll even meet you three quarters of the way. I just need to take, see you take a step forward so that we can approach yeah. this together. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like I sometimes will, I'll be like, go watch a few of my YouTube videos and just have them sort of see if it's even calling to them because if they're Absolutely. like, no, you know, it's not just going to be a waste of your money. And it, it also is sometimes a lot of people have dealt with revolving door where they're like, they've seen therapists, they've seen practitioners and 
had to tell their story over and over again and haven't really got past the storytelling phase, but it can be traumatic. You see Absolutely. all these different faces and people and, you know, yeah. And so how did you, so your, you know, your passion is, is working with people who are dealing with addiction, living with addiction. How did you get into it? <laughs> it can kind of great. Yeah. yeah. It's, we talked about this before we started the play. This is how things were going to start. Right. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and for all the viewers, I mean, I've done podcasts before and, and again, obviously I've shared that, you know, I have my own lived story with addiction. Um, and I always go with this, um, tension of really talking about the work that I do, the people that I help, how I help them and how I connect them to services that um, support based services. And, and there's always a bit of my story that gets out there and, and I don't want that to cloud things, but um, you know, I've like you, I've got a YouTube channel. I've got um, Facebook videos and stuff that, that go into various aspects of, of things. I've been on other podcasts. So, you know, why is it like, how is it that I got into this? Well, I mean, I never started out. I've been practicing as a naturopathic doctor um, for 17, 18 years now, since 2003. And I would say the first seven to 10 years, I wasn't really focusing. I never had this like burning desire to really work with addiction. And, um, you know, I was focusing on working on hormones and, and all that stuff. And of course, I lived out in British Columbia, Vancouver, and the scope of practice of naturopathic doctors is different than it is here in Ontario. Um, function a lot more like family doctors. So we can do a lot more acute based stuff. Um, and in some ways, I mean, I loved it in some ways it pulled me away from the naturopathic roots and some of the, mm -hmm. you know, diet, nutrition and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the other reason why, um, I wasn't really focusing in on addiction is because I was struggling with my own stuff. I didn't know it at the time. Um, you know, I had what I would have considered a healthy party life. Um, and, and it wasn't until about 2013 when I realized that I, I really needed help. And so that's kind of where my journey began in recovery. Mm -hmm. And also when I decided that part of my journey, like I couldn't just have addiction and struggle with addiction and not mean anything and not be able to help other people. So um, when I finally got through into, um, you know, the darkest, deepest parts of my recovery at the beginning, I realized I wanted to give back. So I went back to school to become an addiction counselor. And so since 2013, I've been focusing a lot of my practice on helping individuals with mental health and addiction and more so, and we talked about this um, just a few minutes ago is family members, family members and loved ones, because it doesn't matter what kind of work that I do with the individual struggling. If they don't have a support network, if they don't have friends and family that understand a little bit of what they're going through and, and how to help them, uh, their, I shouldn't say their success rate is hindered, uh, but in some ways, the foundation isn't as strong as, as I would like it to be. And, uh, and that was from what I experienced personally. And now after working for, you know, eight years in addiction, what I've noticed with patients. So, um, you know, part of my own journey has kind of spurred me into doing some additional training. And then of course I have a desire to really help others. So that's where, that's why I'm here. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And there's such a need for it in the naturopathic world. I think in, in the medical community, in the, in the healing community, I don't think there's a really good understanding of addiction for the general practitioner. I think it's, and it can be approached wrongly with the best of intentions. You know, I think it's really helpful to have people who are focused on it. And can you talk about the work you're doing? Cause I know you moved to Ontario. What, right. what's, what are you up to now? Like what's, what are you, are you doing private practice? Are you involved? I know you mentioned an organization that you're involved in. I've got What's my up? pen so I, so I can write little notes that I want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, so yeah. Because so uh, I'm a yes. tangent, so I need to make notes for myself too, otherwise I'll never come back. Yeah. <laughs> Could I see your pen for a second? Oh, it's a Dollarama. This a is Bic. a true... Oh, no, it's a Bic, so it might not be Dollarama. Okay. You know what I used to do? I used to bite the... the um, oh. The, uh, no, 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 the, the little part that sticks in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you yeah, get yeah. The, the ink in your mouth? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. so there's your there's a tangent for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, two one one thing before I even go into that is you you talked about some of the how general practitioners, chiropractors, massage therapists, even GPs, family doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I, I think there could be more education that goes into addiction, and that's really where my project Starlight. So Project Starlight mm -hmm. for everyone watching, <clears throat> this was something that myself and a colleague of mine, Kenya Mate. Uh, Tanya, 
Well, she's no longer Tanya Mate. But Come on, in. C- come on in. I, I, I have no idea what it is now, but <laughs> before that it was Tanya Hollow and she was a student of mine and Tanya and I went around Canada and we created what's called Project Starlight and it was uh, really an addiction primer that brought, it, it really it brought mostly naturopaths together, but it was, the idea was for it to bring other health professionals in there and just give them the languages, language and tools to be able to ask questions about addiction, kind of take down stigma and to learn a little bit more about what options are out there. And, and that was because I saw and Tanya saw a need for increased addiction education in healthcare. Mm-hmm. And that was any profession. And so, you know, that's, I, I, I do want to bring that up again. I want to actually um, start, I've got a lot on my plate, but, um, and moving to Ontario has been a big move, but my goal would be probably in 2022 is to get that workshop up and running again mm-hmm. and in which case when I do I'm going to be reaching out to you to see if you want to help join with join with that because yes. I do think there's a big need now of course you know you look at the news you see especially during this pandemic there is this uh have you heard the term echo pandemic well I haven't heard that term but I can imagine what you're referring to which yeah it's the, like yeah there's the pandemic and then there's these echoes mm-hmm. of other types of micro pandemics that they're not new mm-hmm. but we're starting to see, you know, the overdose rates elevated in in certain um, cities. Now, what's interesting, and I don't know if you saw this, but I've actually looked at some research and it's showing things like suicide rates down and overdose rates down, which, Hmm. which I don't know if this is, and I need to look into this because media can skew a lot of things. So my view on this is that, you know, what we're seeing with COVID, we're seeing a lot of great heart going out and we're also maybe seeing where we're not supporting certain populations like we we can like we're have no problem giving CERB and Qs and CBAs and all these you know acronym based support systems out for people that have businesses and rightfully so um, but there is some stigma that I think keeps people from wanting to help out other people that maybe mm-hmm. are struggling with addiction because the truth is addiction isn't just the person living on the street it's the lawyers the doctors the plumbers the electricians the moms the dads the grandparents mm-hmm the grandparents like I mean I've Mm -hmm. it's it's really crazy like it hits all walks of life and I mean it would be I it would be hard to find one person on this planet that isn't touched in some way with addiction Mm -hmm. and so um I moved from Vancouver to Ontario just a year and a half ago and that was well because you know my parents are getting older I'm from Ontario originally and me and my partner decided that we either make our life in Vancouver which I would have been happy to or come back to Ontario to be closer to friends and family that I grew up with. And, and I had these great opportunities when I moved here to, I uh, worked with um, a psychologist, which you actually connected me to. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, and that, 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 did, that didn't work out. Uh, uh, COVID happened and change ups occurred. And quite honestly, I mean, what happened right after that is I got connected with uh, a medical doctor who owns an integrative executive clinic here in Etobicoke and uh, started chatting with him. His niece is actually a naturopathic doctor, an old student of mine in in BC. And uh, so I've been working at this wonderful clinic called Deerfields and, um, you know, Dr. Randy Knipping, Dr. Simon Rattan, she worked with Andrew Weil, did one of his integrative residencies in in Arizona. So I have an ability to really work with an advanced scope of practice because I do get delegation from the medical doctors. And so Hmm. delegation basically means a healthcare professional can delegate part of their scope to another healthcare professional. And so I do get a lot of my BC license ability. So being able to prescribe things like naltrexone for addiction, um, be able to do the IVs that I do, the NAD plus, the amino acids. Um, And so a lot of what I do right now is general practice, and uh but also addiction coaching addiction counseling supplements optimization uh i'm really big on connecting to community 12 step smart recovery life ring refuge recovery and so a lot of what i'm doing now is trying to build those resources because Mm -hmm. i i i knew what they were in bc and uh, i i wasn't as familiar with what's around the gta area and um COVID has been amazing because what never used to be online, like eight, 12 step AA, NA really had, as far as I know, not very many, if any online groups. Mm -hmm. And now they're all online. Right. 
Yeah, because that was an issue at the beginning of everything that people couldn't go to their meetings. You know, some people are going daily to meetings and they need it mm -hmm. to stay alive or, you know, and yeah, and uh, that's good. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's increasing the convenience factor, almost the anon anonymity factor too. People are concerned about that in yeah. a certain sense, like your neighbor's not going to see you going to a meeting or that kind of thing, but. No, but uh, it does pull up an issue though. <laughs> that is, um because it's in your home. Right. And so there is a, a level of anonymity that like you get to see in my place, mm -hmm. although it's mm -hmm. like a postage size square, mm -hmm. but what happens if you live in a small condo and you've got a partner yeah. and you can't find a, another room. So you're in these meetings and you've yeah. got whoever can hear in the background. So right. where at one point it would be you going into is quite confidential and, and right. your anonymity is protected for the most part to, yeah, sure. you. It, there's an there's an easeability, there's an accessibility aspect which Zoom meetings have have allowed for, but there's also a little bit of anonymity mm. that is lost, yeah. a little bit of protection. It's a good yeah. point, actually. Yeah, like some, certain patients of mine have been like, "Oh, I'm just in the bathroom right now in the bathtub, yeah. talking to you," because my partner's like, right, and then there, you, know, you get quiet when you're actually talking about relationship issues or whatever. Yeah, I've had that happen too. Yeah, so it is. It is complex you know it's not yeah and what's what are what are the, some of the resources actually maybe you can tell me what are like when you've done work with project starlight and worked with nds what were you finding were some of the biggest uh, maybe this is a loaded question or a big question but what are some of the biggest misconceptions around addiction that health practitioners or nds had that you were like oh this we got to fix this <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, well, you actually brought one up right at the beginning, which was a misconception that, and again, I speak from my own experience and, and my own personal experience as well as my professional experience, but in no way is what, is what I say 100% true for everyone, right? But um, one of the biggest things that I find is family members cutting off their loved ones when they're mm -hmm. relapsing or when they're, we've got an addiction. It's like, if you don't get better, you're, well, I'm not seeing you again. Um, and passionate distancing, separation, whatever that, I don't know what that word is that you're using, you but I, in yeah. my head, I was like, I think I know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have showed you a video by a guy named Johan Hari. It's a YouTube video. And it's what you think you know about addiction is a wrong, mm -hmm. is wrong. And, um, and again, it's just an, a, uh, an opinion, but it's based on um, a, a PhD researcher out of Simon Fraser University that did something called Rat Park. And it, what he noticed was he noticed rats. Um, if you put a rat in a cage and you fed it heroin or cocaine laced water, I can't remember, this um, rat would, would like drink the water obsessively um, and, and get high off of whatever drug was laced in the water. But if you put that rat in a big park with a bunch of other rats and tunnels and ladders and stuff, and you put that same water there, the rat would would be less likely to drink that water and be more likely to socialize. And of course, I mean, we're not rats, but what it got them thinking is, is there actually something to be said about um, community? Mm -hmm. And how can community come together to help people that are struggling with addiction? And, and I actually believe that it's like, you know, I think it's completely appropriate to say to your loved one if they're relapsing and and you know they're they're just not participating in life so much. Um, completely okay to say, look, at, I love you. I can't be around this all the time. I'm happy to take you out for a coffee or go for a walk with you, but I, I just can't support what you're doing right now. Um, I'm not going to give you any money. I'm not going to you know pamper you, baby you, um, but I'm also not going to turn my back from you. I'm still going to give you love. And so that's the big piece. It's never turn your love away from your love, from your loved one. I mean, they, if I were to look at where I was at my deepest, if my family and friends turned their backs on me and some did, some did. And that was so hard, so hurtful and painful. And it had, I had every single person turn their back to me. A lot of people would say, well, shouldn't that have been enough to get you going? But when you're in an, an addictive cycle, it's, it's your prefrontal cortex, the the part of your executive function of the brain that would normally say, hey, don't do this, do this. It's hijacked. Like it doesn't even have time to respond before the midbrain, that limbic system that runs on instinct and runs on, on emotion hijacks. And so even, even though 
I'm an intellectual person and I had a lot going for me, I was still making decisions that brought me back into relapse. Mm -hmm. And if I knew that all my friends and family pulled their love away from me, that would be even less reason to, to want to get out. Like, I know it sounds weird to say that, and it would be more of a reason to medicate or use in order for me not to feel those emotions. Mm. So that was probably the biggest one. Yeah, that's good. I mean, cause I think, I don't know what it is with our society, but we seem to think that motivating via shame, and I'm not saying that's what that is with the distancing, like, but I think there's a difference between having boundaries for your own self-care Absolutely. and yeah. like and, and examining your own codependent tendencies, let's say that, that actually may be worsening someone's addiction because they're in this, this uh, cycle or this maybe toxic relationship, et cetera. Yeah. And, and sort of saying, okay, you know, like you said, I need to step back from this friendship or whatever it is versus like for your own good, I'm going to cut you out. That's totally, you know, it's, then it's about you and not me and my boundaries. Yeah. Um, but I think we also, there seems to be in healthcare and society, this erroneous understanding that shame is a positive motivator, <laughs> like, you know, like with weight loss or whatever it is, like cigarette smoking, whatever behavior we think is unproductive, we tend to like, oh, let's shame and stigmatize it and people won't do it. And it's yeah. like, clearly not because there's already a, probably a lot of shame if you're dealing with addiction, that when you just feel more of it, and you feel more senses, a sense of worthlessness or isolation, it's just going to worsen the addiction, you know? Yeah. Um, we talk about in the addiction world and so true. I mean, I'm glad you brought up healthy boundaries because it's exactly, you don't have to put yourself as a loved one. Like you need to put healthy boundaries because you are actually more important. Like you, you need to take care of your health. Um, there's a way of doing that while still loving your loved one, while still letting them know that you're, you'll be there for them. It may not be in the way that they want or need you, but that you're never going to turn your love away from them, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I, you probably know this, but one of the big things that's talked about in addiction and addiction recovery is the difference between shame and guilt. And so you're right. In addiction, we are swimming in shame. Mm -hmm. And one of the cool things about, uh, and I, I go to 12-step. I, you know, I'm the librarian for our chapter. I chair a meeting once a week. Um, I get to give out the chips, um, do virtual chip counts. So it's pretty cool, actually. Um, and the great thing for me is I, I can see when shame starts to bubble off a person, when they start to share their story. A lot of times when you are so ashamed, I'm using the word ashamed, when you're so much, when you're so ashamed, you don't want to talk, talk to people. You don't want to tell your story. But when you start to see people open up, even patients, when I come and open up about their story, it's like, oh my God, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing I know that you're actually processing some of that shame because you're now talking about it. Mm. When you're struggling in that deep sea of shame, it's, it's hard to even admit mm. what's happened. And, um, and so the difference between, this is my understanding, and this is what I teach people about shame and guilt is, shame is like, this is an awful analogy, but it's the only one that, it's the one I learned and it's the one I keep using, is like when you're walking down a street and you, and, and you accidentally trip over a person or trip a person over, they fall down. Guilt is, oh my gosh, let me help you up. I can't believe I did that. I'm going to be more careful next time. Shame is, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I did that. I'm such a bad person. I, can't, I shouldn't even have got out of the house today. Shame is almost like a narrative that they make about themselves. They are their shame. They can't separate it. Whereas guilt is something that can be very positive. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I need to be more mindful next time. It's actually more, there's more action with, with mm -hmm. guilt than there is with shame. And so um, I always found that a really interesting, because if you think of it, what's the difference between guilt and shame? Mm -hmm. Shame is really what people in addiction struggle with. Yeah. It's and, like, uh, I think Brittany Brown says, I think it's her that says this, that um, shame is I'm wrong and guilt is I've done something wrong, you know? Oh, I've never heard, I've never heard that, but she's, she's wonderful. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's, it's, yeah, if, if I'm wrong, if, if the problem resides within me, then I'm, there's no hope that I can change, that I can change or I can feel better or anything that my, that my situation can change. Like if you think that you're just a bad person that bumps into people, she's probably going to continue to do it. But if you're like, oh, it's because I wasn't paying attention and that's not on me, you know, it's just, I'm tired today, whatever. You have some external reason for your behavior. It's a lot easier to change that behavior, you know? 
Can you say that again? What does she say? Shame or guilt is I've done something wrong and shame is I am wrong. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've had a, a, a old counselor of mine saying, say to me once, Aaron, we are human beings. We are not human doings. <laughs> so just because the actions of what we do does not make us it just, you do not have to internalize and personalize that. We are human beings. We're here to be. We're not what we do. And so, you know, we, everyone makes mistakes. Everyone does things that we wouldn't consider, you know, wonderful, but that doesn't make it mean that's who you are. And I always thought that you're a human being, not a human doing. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's like part of what I liked about 12 step is the opportunity to make amends that it's just part of the process that it's like a given that you're going to need to you know yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah for sure. but even for everybody even for Al-Anon codependence anonymous it's, it's one of the step eight yeah step eight step four is often the the, yeah. <laughs> the hardest one it's all about you know making a list of your character defects or de character defaults is what my sponsor likes to call them um, and then, you know, sharing those and asking God for forgiveness. And you know what I mean? As I say this, I recognize that there will be a large, large portion of people watching this that would be like, oh, I can't 12 step. It's too God. It's too. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my, like when we did the, um, when I did Project Starlight, I was not a 12 stepper. Mm -hmm. I was actually very anti 12 step. And I believe here I brought some. Um, a really good friend of mine, um, Annie, she came in and uh, she, she spoke and she's, she's a lovely, uh, lovely, lo lovely woman. And she was a big 12 stepper. And her and I have actually laughed a little bit about this because she's, I mean, I don't know where she's at right now with it, but I've kind of really embraced um, 12 step just because it was, it's a great community and something that um, my biggest take home message for any doctor that I speak with, any naturopath or healthcare professional is that um, you can help a person with supplements or medications or IVs or whatever it is, but if you don't connect them with a recovery community, um, their, their success rate is going to be lower. And so I'm a big believer in whatever that community is. It can be 12 step. It can be smart recovery. It can be sober friends. It can be loving family. That's, you know, unconditionally supportive. Um, I, I think it's, it's a must. Mm, yeah I think it, yeah because one thing shame does is isolate us so there's they, they go hand in hand so if you, you have to treat the isolation you know you have to treat the end of the root cause and yeah. and it, I love that you talk about Rat Park I got excited I was hoping mm -hmm. Rat Park would come up yeah yeah well that's that's isolation right there right it's like what's the opposite exactly. of of addiction is connection exactly yeah, yeah. right that's great uh, that's i love that because that's i think you know the whole whatever nancy reagan in the 80s where it was like yeah. just say the no war on drugs and, yeah war on drugs and so it it was like well look at that if you give a rat cocaine water he'll he'll reject food and, and other water and just like you know coke himself to death look at that look how addictive this substance is look how dangerous this substance is but then you're like but the rat totally ignores it, maybe just use it recreationally, when he's in an environment that is healing and, and, and holistic and um, natural to the rat, when he has rat toys, interesting things to do and other rats, yeah. then it's not, so it's not, uh, clearly not the substance, it's the, it's the environment in which the person finds themselves, right? That, that will foster, create the addiction. So when you start to address some of those factors, like the isolation, the shame, you know, that, then you have a hope of healing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's the one part that I think is missing the most. I mean, of course, there's genetics that play a role. There's nurturing and there's like, so there's a nurture nature aspect. That's part of that too. There's nutritional deficiencies. There's a bunch of, it's multimodal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Psychosocial, spiritual, you know, all that stuff, behavioral. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the one part I think needs more understanding is, is really the environment and I and you know who's wonderful for that is like Gabor Mate and and talking about trauma and the and um compassionate inquiry like how do you actually talk with someone in a compassionate way to elicit connection I think is is quite beautiful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. What's his, what's his style? I've listened to some lectures from him, but I don't know much about compassion inquiry. What's that? You know, like? I've never taken any training from him, believe it or not. I mean, I've been, I've been, if this is Ga Gabor Gabor, I've been around the circle. Yeah. I haven't actually really gotten in. I've looked into, he's actually got a, you, you may find this interesting. He's got a trauma. I would go pull up on my phone. It's on one of my web pages. It's a trauma course that he's offering or compassion inquiry course. He's offering for mm. health professionals. It's like eight, eight lectures. Um, I'm thinking about it. He also, um, Beyond Addiction is a program that was put together by Sat Dharam Kar, who is a naturopathic doctor. Her and Gabor got together and, and did a whole wonderful 16 week program. I've been on the edge of doing all of this and I've never, I've never got into it. So I can't answer you exactly because I've never, mm. I haven't actually fully embraced that. Um, I've read his books. Um, I've watched some of his lectures. I think what it is, is it goes back to um, there's a wonderful counselor, Carl Rogers. And uh, if anyone does any counseling, built, he's one of the main counseling theories that, that's mm -hmm. out there, our counselor, psychologist that's out there. And it's like, there's three core conditions to therapeutic, to forming a therapeutic relationship and to encouraging change. And that is um, unconditional positive regard, mm -hmm. which is, doesn't matter what you say, uh, that isn't you. You know, you are a human being, not a human doing. And I don't judge for that. There's congruence, so that's the ability of the counselor, the therapist, or the naturopath, or the healer to actually just be themselves and not put on a mask. And then um, the third is being able to express empathy, so empathic understanding and empathic statements. So understanding or calling out the emotional state of another person, and um, just letting that other person know that you, you know you're not you're not walking in their shoes, but you're walking with them, and you understand that emotion and calling it out and so I think a lot of his work is around that mm -hmm. and how to actually talk to someone without putting up a wall mm -hmm. yeah it's like yeah I think we there's a book called um the gift of therapy by uh something shalom he also wrote um another book that I that that's name escapes me I think it's um if Freud I don't know, something it's a book it's sort of a fictional book about um about uh, Freud and one of his students, but the gift of therapy, basically it's like, looks at all the different kinds of therapy and it's like, we know therapy works, but you could do literally any kind of therapy. It doesn't really matter the, the modality, let's say like whether it's CBT or EMDR or whatever it is, what really matters is the relationship you have with your therapist and that it was really a Rogerian Absolutely. Yeah. approach. Yeah. Yeah. The Rogers knew he, he got it, you know, cause I think there's, there are different styles that don't necessarily take that compassion approach like I think before Rogers people were told to just be a blank slate and he was like no the blank slate makes people feel horrible because <laughs> you're talking to a poker face and you feel worse you, you your own um, projections bounce back at you so your own shame is reflected off of a poker face if somebody's there to provide like a corrective experience for you mm -hmm. um, and you can tell your you, you know your character defaults whatever it is a step forward to somebody and they can just receive them and still love you or still you know consider you a good person then that's very healing you know that yeah, in and of itself can be healing yeah yeah and i mean it just the just like pause and for the people that are watching this just pause and think about that for a second like if you we've all done stuff that we're not happy about right but can you imagine actually um, feeling to put yourself back into a moment when you actually live that experience and you check in with yourself and you just feel whatever that is like shame and sadness and fear, whatever it is. And imagine that if you had to share that with someone and that person was able to hear it and reflect it back to you in a compassionate, understanding, forgiving way um, versus actually, and tell me a little bit more about that. Like, if you think about those two, those two, very different approaches. I think it's very easy to see that um, you absolutely, mm. I think can resolve some of that shame, bubble off that shame when you've got someone that's receptive on the other end in, in a very you know, loving, kind way. And uh, so I, I love beautiful how you, how you just you know, shone that. Cause for me, I was like, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Carl Rogers, wonderful yeah, man. Rogers. Yeah. Hats off to Rogers. <laughs> yeah. Him and Mr. Rogers. I don't know. The last name Rogers. I guess you're like a gentle soul. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, well, um, 
was I going to say about that is also this idea of inquiry, like curiosity, you know, mm. I think is helpful because when we're trying to, we can't change something that we don't understand. You know, so someone's coming with the, with the goal of change. Um, it's helpful to really kind of, you want to carve something out of your life. You got to contour the edges. You have to be, be able to understand how it fits in your life, you know? And so, but from a, from a non-judgmental stance, like, you know, what, what, what has my history been? When has, you know, when have I, I say narrative therapy, like when I, when I have not been doing my preferred behavior or being in my preferred identity, you know, like when, when have I, uh, not been doing what I would prefer to be doing. And so really understanding that can help with, you can't change it if you don't understand it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. It's being, it's being curious. I love really, I mean, I tell patients, let's be curious, you yeah. know, I like to ask questions. Let's be curious about that. So I think that's such an important aspect to really understanding ourselves and where we're going and where we, where we come from. That's beautiful. Can we talk about harm reduction? That's an interesting. Such a, it's a, I love it. And it's such a controversial topic. And I think I can talk about a bunch of different aspects of it. Let me start off with something that I find, I, I hate politics, but I mean, it exists. Um, but if you're looking at the different camps of treatment, like there really are two different camps, right? There are the harm reductionist camps and harm reduction is really, um, how do you reduce the harms of a substance while still possibly having substances in a person's life um, and allowing them to improve their quality of life and allow them to integrate more into society? And so the examples of that would be the safe injection site. So if you're someone who uses heroin, let's do it in a safe environment where the infection rates going down and the death rates or overdose death rates are going down because you're in a safe environment. Harm reduction could also be you know, switching, this is debatable, switching cigarettes to vaping. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the abstinence camp, which is, you know, complete abstinence. So I am I am so for both. And I think everyone's a, a individual. And quite honestly, and this is where me and my friend Annie really divulged because she was a true abstinence camp and I was true harm reduction. What's interesting about my story is that I, even in my recovery, I still would drink alcohol occasionally and I still smoke pot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, I, I no longer, I, I'm fully abstinent now, but that was part of my recovery. Part of my journey was harm reduction. So for me, I was very much, I lived a life of harm reduction. Um, I still, you know, I would still smoke marijuana and to the people in the abstinence camp, it was no, I mean, that's, you can't come to 12 step because 12 step is, is abstinence. Um, and so for me, but what was happening was my, my life was improving. I was able to get out there and help people. And yes, I was still attached to substance and I was still addicted, but I was able to have a life that I wanted. Now mm -hmm. it wasn't as full as it is now. Um, and now that I'm on this side of things, I really think abstinence is, is amazing, but that's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but we look about funding. So public funding, government funding for the different types of treatments, right? You, you get an allotment of funds from the government that is all abstinence. So you go to um, you know, private or public treatment centers and most of them are, are abstinence-based. There are some that are harm reduction. And so there's a fight between the two camps for funding. That's one thing. Uh, there's also societal prejudice towards the harm reduction. You see a lot of negative news media that come out on you know, the safe injection site. I mean, I lived in Vancouver. I lived literally, literally lived three blocks away from the very first supervised injection site. But boy, did it save lives. Did it provide, and it provided an opportunity for people that wanted to get better to get better. Mm -hmm. Was it perfect? No, but I, I believe harm reduction is the way any government should go. Because if we put fear and we start to, um, criminalize addictive behavior, um, you're, I think we're making it, we're increasing stigma. We're also making it difficult for people to reach out for, to ask for help because they're afraid they're going to get arrested. Um, we're increasing overdose death rates. Uh, we're ripping families apart. We're, we're prosecuting and putting people into jail for, 
or possession of, of you know, personal quantities. So, I mean, that, that would be my, that's my view of harm reduction. Mm -hmm. And of course there's some community-based support. So while we have 12 step, which, which preaches abstinence, there are people in the 12 step community that um, still, still utilize harm reduction. Mm -hmm. So if you're an NA, Narcotics Anonymous, um, if cocaine is your poison or your drug of, of misuse, um, or that person may still smoke pot. And so in the 12 step, you're not going to say, you know, I still smoke pot all the time. You're not going to say that part, but you know, you're there because your primary drug of choice, the drug that brings you to the knees that takes you out is cocaine. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're not using that, it doesn't matter what else you're doing. As long as you're going to work, you're, you're loving your family, you've got friends, you're being productive. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Then you've got smart recovery, for example, is a harm reduction based community program. And so if you are someone that likes more of the science and dealing with urges, coping strategies, understanding triggers, smart recovery is, is the community-based support. And they talk about harm reduction and it's not abstinence-based. Mm -hmm. It's like having like yeah. different flavors you can, you know, cause not everyone's gonna resonate with abstinence right off the bat. But I went to a, a lecture on the, on the Insight a few years ago Oh yeah. Um, yeah. It would, and it would like change my life. Like, I don't know. It was just a lecture. So it was just kind of, but very, who, talk, who lectured it? Uh, well, if you say names, maybe I'll remember, but he was, um, was he the, was his name Tim? Maybe he was thin, tall guy, really charismatic, great public speaker. Oh. Um, I knew a few people from there. Um, I don't know if it's had like a rock star background or he had some okay. sort of uh, unconventional background. It wasn't like a healthcare background or something. It was more like he's more artistic. Did he work uh, there? I think so. He, he wasn't one of the founders, but he was featured in um, publications on it, maybe okay. the newspaper, but he gave the lecture. Um, and it just, the statistics were just like completely it was one of those things where you're like it's clearly political why this can't why this isn't in every major city in Canada you know the idea that the the issues with yeah it was like you know somebody who uses heroin is oftentimes like hiding behind a dumpster injecting puddle water you know oh my gosh yeah or even the idea that most they were saying that most um, female identifying users do not know how to self inject that they rely on pimps, partners, dealers to do it for them, and that they can even just empower you to be able to inject yourself with your own substance, you know, um, and that that empowerment was leading to, again, like decreasing the stigma and, and bubbling off the shame and incur and giving people a sense of autonomy and potentially increasing the chance that someone would want to right abstain you know it's almost like yeah um but with that yeah when you're steeped in shame hiding behind a dumpster you're not going to be like oh you know i'm going to be abstinent tomorrow maybe you will but it, the chances of that happening you know it's, yeah. it's stuff you're working against a lot um yeah it was really it was really great and i think in toronto there is one but i haven't heard much about it really is there really on queen west i thought that they had oh, it, I, one up maybe I, maybe i heard about that yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's fascinating. I mean, I, I thank you for sharing that because I actually hadn't heard it from the part of empowering women to, to self inject um, because you're right, actually, a lot of it is being relied, relied upon from someone else. And then you're actually giving, not only are you giving your power away to the drug, but you're also giving it to the pimp or the dealer or whoever else it is. Right. Uh, there's so much controversy around that. I mean, I just, Two things. One is, let me share my story about the safe injection site. So I, I taught at Boucher Institute of Naturopathic Medicine for 12 years. And that, so that's the naturopathic college that's out in New West, just outside of Vancouver. And one of the second year courses that I taught, um, there it was all project-based and we would separate in groups. And one of the groups was always addiction. And I always encouraged each group to actually check out the safe injection site. And so the students would go down and they would do a morning, an hour tour of the safe injection site before it, because it closed between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. for cleaning. Mm -hmm. And so they would go in at nine, do a tour, and um, they'd come back and it would change their lives. Like I would have people, like I can still think of two people right now, two students that were so against mm -hmm. um, a, like safe injection that they came back and it was like you could see tears in these people's eyes and because I think it's hard not to see 
how much human compassion is involved with, with this, because this is a very marginalized community and their lives do mean something, right? And for a lot of time, these individuals think their lives don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine, like how much would you wanna get out of addiction if you feel like you're shit and everyone else thinks that you're shit? Mm -hmm. So to give them some autonomy, to give them some self-worth, um, hey, and, and your idea of self-worth may not be what their idea of self-worth is, but sharing what you did about being able to inject yourself, I mean, it sounds silly, but no, that can be huge. And it may be enough to get them to say, you know what, if I can do that, maybe I can get out of this. Maybe I can change my life. The second part of that is when I was doing my, so I did my um, addiction counseling program through Vancouver Community College, which is again, just down the street from there. And I had to do a practicum and one of my patients uh, was a nurse practitioner that worked um, out of onsite, which is the, uh, so the insight was the safe injection part and onsite was actually a, a transitional onsite residence where people could live for 30 or 60 days. Mm -hmm. um, and the hope was to get them out of that world. And I remember touring, I was going to do my practicum. I never ended up doing it with, with him, um, which is too bad. I mean, I could have done it. I don't know why I didn't now that I think about it, but I was, we went and toured on site when we came out, like when we walked in, there was a group of maybe 12 people outside all injecting on, on Hastings street. We walked upstairs, came out and as we're leaving and walking away from that area, we hear someone get the Narcan. And it was crazy. Like I got to see the nurse practitioner I was with went in and, you know, got the Narcan, which basically reverses the overdose. And I saw a whole community of nurse practitioners, of people that were struggling with drug, drug addiction, come together and help this young, young guy, early 20s, um, who they could see leaving this life. And it was just like, even as I tell this, I still get, um, I can still feel those emotions because in that moment I was frozen and it was like, I get to see people that you would never think would just we just came together to help this one young boy. He survived, thankfully. It was crazy to see how quickly that revived, but like, oh my gosh, that was that changed my life. Now, when it comes to, um, it's a community. I mean, mm. you know, they may not outwardly, you may not think that they've got much life, but they come together. They may live on the street. They, they may still actually huddle behind garbage bins um, but they've got a place to go, a warm place to go, to drink some coffee, to drink some water, and to just to gain some some opportunity. Mm. Yeah, and like there's there, there's these details that they talked about that I was really impressed by from a community intervention standpoint, like just really understanding the needs of the community that you're trying to serve. So it was like they had a security guard at the door to protect the participants, but when they were like, why aren't people coming in? Oh, because they see security uniformed officer at the door, they're not gonna wanna go in. And so they're like, oh, so let's find a different way to protect people, have security, but not make it seem like, you know, mm -hmm. you're walking past an armed guard, um, even down to like, everyone's identified by a nickname and they get to choose it. So it like creates this sense of, empowerment this this community because you get to choose your own identity but then you're also uh protected you know your confidentiality is protected mm -hmm. and so like like dropping these barriers to access in these really creative ways was really cool um to hear about and yeah and how they were just creating a community based on the needs of the community which is the, really the only way to do it you know if you don't really understand your community you're like yeah here's a, here's something we we're going to offer you. And they're like, thanks, but this isn't, you don't get me, you know? What's, uh, what's interesting is um, you, you remind me of something. It's a little bit off topic. It's not off topic, but it's uh, Vancouver is really cool. They had this one program called car 87. So what it was, was, and, and I believe Ontario is looking at doing something like this and it's talking about mental health basically. And it's, um, you know, if you've got someone that's struggling with crisis, instead of calling the police to come and de-escalate, when we know how successful that has been, and, you know, it's been all over the news, especially here in Toronto, um, the, Vancouver has this really unique project. It's been around for almost 10 years, I bet. It's called Car 87, and it's an unmarked, plainclothes police officer connected with either a psychiatric nurse or a social worker. And the two come out 
as a team to the site of what's been called and that they can take them to the hospital. They don't arrest them. They can provide treatment on site. And it's just, I mean, instead of having a cop come and cause you're right, mm-hmm. the actual blues can trigger people. Yeah. It can, throw, it can actually activate ancestral trauma. Like if you think about the generational trauma that some of these communities have had, I mean that like, who's going to go and, and want to open up or get help from that. So what I loved about this was there is actually a model that exists in Vancouver. And of course, they've just got one team that rotates, right? So it, if the call's out, if they're out, then the next person is probably going to get a, a police officer. But mm. it's actually kind of cool. Vancouver's got some pretty progressive yeah. progressive things in place. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. You're just letting NDs, you know, <laughs> practice to the extent of their training. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's nice. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Like, yeah, I think I, I forget her name, but she's a mental health advocate and uh, sort of part of the anti-psychiatry movement, though. She's she got that. So but she talks about that, like um, a story she shares where uh, an individual went to would go to their neighbor, her, her neighbor's house every night, completely naked and say something like, I'm I need help or something like that. And, and she's like, the neighbors are like, who do I call? Because you, you end up calling the cops. That's sort of your response. And that's, those are the wrong people to call. You know, she doesn't, she's not dangerous. She doesn't mean harm. She feels scared. You know, she feels vulnerable. She's asking for help. So having a team of people who are trained that you can call, because as a neighbor, you probably also don't know what to do, you know, and we freeze and we get defensive and yeah, so actually having people who are equipped to handle certain situations is helpful you know yeah (laughs) basic level logic but you know uh, funding in politics yeah exactly funding in politics and and yeah and just yeah i mean i've i've definitely have had conversations about insight and people have knee-jerk reaction to like but that's condoning substance use Right. And it, yeah, it's hard to shift that mentality when you've been trained in an abstinence model or an, in a, you know, a, a, that, that just say no model, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. you should have just not, said no. Yeah. And it's not that easy. I mean, if you, if, if people watching this think that it's just easy that you can just choose not to one day, the one thing that I want to share is just kind of to go back to the biology of the brain. And, you know, research is now showing that addiction really is a disease of the brain. And it is, and I talked about the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system, which is in the midbrain. These are two, I mean, there are two systems in the brain that communicate with each other. The emotional center of the brain is all connected to our senses, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste. It goes right into the amygdala. And right beside the amygdala, this is going to get technical here, is the hippocampus. The hippocampus stores memory. And so what happens, is like if I were to say everyone has this experience and is you know, you've walked down the street, you've heard a song or you smell a smell and you're like, whoa, I remember I was eight years old when this happened. Like how many of us have these experience? That's how powerful in that split second from hearing that sound or smelling that baked bread, you're brought back to a memory years ago. That's kind of what addiction's like. You see these triggers, these cues that happen and your brain automatically remembers the state of being high. And being high is really a state of dopamine. And dopamine allows us to feel good. And that is one learned way of feeling good. You're going to go back to that. And if you keep doing that over and over again, it's like a record player, a record on a record player. The more times that loop is played, the deeper that groove gets, the harder it is to get out of it. And so if you don't have a strong prefrontal cortex, which, yeah, sure, just choose not to do it, fine. But the truth is, and I'll speak from experience here, when I was, this was years ago, but I remember when I was doing cocaine somewhat regularly, this would have been like in my 20s, I remember that whenever we would call the dealer, I would feel high even before I even did a line of coke because my anticipation of using already got that dopamine hit in my brain. And so if I'm already high from that virtual dopamine hit, I'm less likely to be able to cognitively say, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that. It's because my body is already high and I didn't even touch a substance. And that is a nature of what happens in in the addiction cycle. So yes, I'm not saying that the choice is not mine. You know, Mm -hmm. someone struggling with addiction, absolutely. In the end, we have that choice. And we chose to use substances at one point. Um, But 
eventually there comes a point where if we don't have the tools and skills that help us kind of ride those urges mm -hmm. and just kind of sit on our hands and not act and let those urges kind of dissipate, we will start to do what we know best. And that is to pick up and use. Yeah. yeah I'm really glad you, you said that because I say that to my patients all the time. I'm telling them about any, any learned behavior that they're trying to change, uh, you know, that anything you crave. So the, the, the class, I'll try to do this quickly, but like the classic, oh, I feel so great after yoga, but I never want to do it, but I, I want to eat chips or whatever. And I actually fantasize and get excited about going to buy the chips because, it you know, so dopamine is really about getting the reward. But then in, in certain certain substances and certain things in our environment, even things like gambling, sex can boost your dopamine. So you get a hit when you've received the reward as well, which you don't really get from a yoga class. You don't get like a, oh, I'm I'm super high and like stimulated dopamine with yoga. It's more like serotonin. You feel content, you feel relaxed, you feel good. But you, your brain doesn't really lay down the pathway to get there in the way it does with a dopamine boosting activity. So it's like drops down a window pane you know, if you have a crack or a, a fissure in the window, there's, it's more likely the drops are going to go down there. And it's like, it's like, you know, th that train track in the brain is like reinforced the more you hit it with dopamine. And so you said, yeah, like you smell baked bread. If that's connected to that track, it'll just start the whole thing going. And you really don't have much of a chance of getting, getting it to rewire once it's already in action. And like, you know, so it's tough. It's tough to get off that. Like, because we're trying to move to maybe less um, intrinsic, like less rewarding behaviors from that dopamine perspective. We're trying to move to more maybe serotonin based stuff, but you have to really like change those pathways in the brain, which is really tough to do, especially yeah. if the if the things that feed the pathway are still there, which is part of that, like understanding you know, where does it start? Yeah. But that's, that's a common thing. It's like, I get, I get high thinking about it. I get high calling my dealer. That's, that's like super common. Like my patients, they're like, I'm on the subway. I'm planning my chips, <laughs> you know, and it's, it can be something dumb like that, but it's like that. It's like, you're already excited about it. And the chips are kind of irrelevant at that point, but it's already, it's happening. Like you're not yeah. going to get off the train once no, it's not, it's not easy to do that. Yeah. And that's where things like cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness based cognitive mindfulness based cognitive behavioral therapy. Based yeah. Yeah. And, therapy and, BCG. Pops in. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you said it's, it's, it's exactly that it's, um, you get, once you're on the track, it's hard to get off. And mm -hmm. so there are some tools, um, and like the mindfulness based cognitive behavioral based. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is we talk about in 12 step is people, places, and things. Mm. It's like, who are the people, where are the places, and what are the things that actually trigger? And a trigger is an emotional cue. Mm. It can be a sound, it can be a smell, it can be a taste, it can be a person, it can be a play, it can be all these things that um, just make it a little more difficult. So when I'm working with someone in early recovery, I want to minimize the amount of environmental or triggering cues that happen. Mm. Of course, you cannot cleanse everything. You can't sterilize your life. But that's what's great about inpatient treatments because right. you're in a protected environment. You almost don't have to worry about, just can I walk down the street and not get high? Or, you know, is the alarm clock going to wake me up and I'm going to want to use? Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of protection. And if you create a little bit of space where that record isn't looping, or I love that, you know, scratch mm -hmm. on, a, on a pane of glass and the drip going through it. Like if you actually give some space between um, or reduce the amount of times this is happening, you'll actually start to create different pathways you know what fires together wires together in the brain so if the neurons in the brain are firing to create a circuit the more times they fire they'll actually wire and grow together and that's what's called brain plasticity we can actually create different plas different we can encourage that plasticity and take advantage of that by creating different routines and that that is where a lot of this behavior like cognitive and mindfulness-based therapies come into play it also comes into like you know you know, if someone is struggling with addiction, maybe we talk about circles of friends and family, you know, the immediate circle are the people that want the best for you. And they're going to support you no matter what they are safe people to be around. 
second circle are people that maybe have unhealthy relationships with, but they're still good people. You still want them in their life. It just means you're not going to go to their house and hang out with them. You're going to maybe go for a coffee with them for a short period of time, or you're going to chat with them on the phone. And then there's that third circle, which are people that are absolutely unhealthy. They're your drug dealers. You need to actually drop their numbers and, and push them out of your life. And you know what's interesting is you may think, some people may think it's, well, obviously that's a big thing, but a lot of people struggling with addiction start to develop friendships with or acquaintanceships with people they're using with. And, and it's hard. Like I, the amount of people in the fellowship that I go to that have a hard time deleting phone numbers. It like, it just, I, I get it because I mean, I was there, but I, I'm like, Mm-hmm. A good visit a, a fellow of mine. It's like, just delete the freaking number. And he just won't. And mm-hmm. it's because there's this friendship or it's this fear that if I really wanted to pick up, I'm not going to have that number. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it, it's for me, deleting numbers has always been, has always been about like, it, it completely eliminates that possibility. And I, that's, I, you don't want that. Cause just right. you, you, you what, I want to know if that person ever finished their kitchen renovation. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like you, you want to, you want to be in touch with the story. You want the possibility there. Yeah. Deleting, cutting off is really, I don't know. Yeah. It sort of shuts down a, a possibility for adventure or discovery or something like that, that uh, a brain that might need more dopamine probably has a hard time letting go of, you know? Yeah. 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 Cause you want, you want to like have like, it's hard to, yeah, you want all these different possibilities open. That's exciting. You want openness, you know? Um, it's tough though. Yeah. It's a good point. It's not, I, I th- there's a poem called, I think it's called A Crack in the Sidewalk. Have you heard of oh, this poem? No, I haven't. I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll just kind of state it, but it's, um, it's basically like, I see a crack in the sidewalk. I fall in. I didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't know. Oh, I do know this. Yeah, you know that I one? Know yeah. That. Yeah. And so basically, yeah, she's sort of like walking down, falling in the crack and it's like, okay, now it's actually, oh no, I walk, I fall, I, I fall in. It's not my fault. I, I, it takes me a while to get out. Then you sort of learn, she starts saying it is my fault by now. Cause I fell in like the fourth time. And yeah. now I know I immediately had to get out, but I still am falling in. And then finally she's like, I walked down a different street. Yeah. And I think, you know, about essentially it's about neuroplasticity, but possibly addiction too, you know, where it's like, yeah, where if you drop, you got a crack in the glass and you're starting to pour water down it, definitely one's going to go in the crack, you know, yeah. it's going to, it's going to choose that path and go through. So you got it like maybe just another glass or really keep away from the crack. But yeah, yeah, if having this person's number in your phone, every time they text you, you are overcome with cravings and urges to, to slip back into behaviors that you don't want, then it's, yeah, you got to get it yeah it's like we say like root cause like what's upstream from that whole thing Mm -hmm. and yeah all right Aaron I know you said you wanted to you had something at five but any last thoughts I know we could keep talking like this is oh yeah this is uh, yeah and and we probably should we should do like a part two of this yeah let's Um, do it for sure um the well you talked about the little poem and I totally remember that too it's it's a great poem um one of the things that and this is something that I think everyone could use a reminding in. And there's this beautiful piece of literature in NA and it's called yesterday, today, tomorrow. And basically the gist of the poem is that us as humans are often so preoccupied with what happened yesterday and what we should have done, what we could have done. Um, and if we're not, you know, upset or frustrated or want, wishing we could have changed something from yesterday, we're always wondering about what tomorrow is going to bring. You know, um, how's this going to play out? You know, what am I going to be doing? And the truth is, none of those days hold any power on our. We, we should not allow any of those days to hold any power in the present moment because all we actually have is right now. And so I find that super helpful for me in that if I do feel anxiety, if I feel stress, if I find myself ruminating and preoccupied with these thoughts that are just a negative spiral, which can lead to wanting to cope with addiction or cope with eating or whatever it may be. Just remember that all we actually really have is today and in this moment. And so what I love about um, recovery is that just for today, you know, just for today, 
I need to worry about staying sober. I don't have to worry. I don't have nothing invested in tomorrow. I, I shouldn't even be thinking about tomorrow because it hasn't even come yet. The truth is I could get hit by a car tonight. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really no, but <laughs> yeah. So yesterday, today, tomorrow is a, a beautiful poem. I think it's one that everyone could read. So if you just Google NA yesterday, today, tomorrow, it's a great poem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess the only thing I really wanted to say is that, you know, for everyone watching, if you don't know anyone that's struggling with addiction, if there's no one in your family or friends that are struggling with addiction, just be curious. And, and I find what's really important, again, this is my impression, is I'm really big on the stigma and stigmatization of addiction. Just watch the language that that is being used around you. Like, like you talk about the alky or the crackhead or, you know, like it, it, think about if someone in your family was really struggling and they didn't know how to ask for help, would they want to come up? Would you, they see you as a safe person to reach out to? And that's one thing that was really big for me is that, you know, there's some friends and family in my life that I would never ever go to because I just know what their opinion is of it. And it doesn't mean that that's truly how they feel, but really the words that we use can be really stigmatizing and it can actually keep people in their addiction. And so what's important is how can you be a safe person? Like, how are you able to be someone that if you've got a parent, a sister, a brother, a friend, a partner that really needs help, and wants to, and hasn't reached out, how can you actually make it, mm. how can you be a safe person? Mm. That's great, yeah. It's like wear a wristband that says WWCRD. <laughs> what would Carl Rogers do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I wonder if they've got those. <laughs> yeah, they should. <laughs> you're just, yeah, you just snap your wristband. You're like, okay, I've got to be more Rogerian in my conversation with my family member. Yeah, or around the Thanksgiving dinner table or whatever. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aaron. This is great. Yeah, and definitely let's do part two. Absolutely. We got another we'll, hour. We'll wait four months this time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. This is great. Absolutely. Thank you.